So today I'm going to talk about uh, land subsidence, and this has recently become um, a uh, kind of a hot topic uh, because of the, the current drought that we're in. Uh, really, by all measures of drought, by the end of this year, uh, this will be recorded as the worst drought um, in recent history. Um, so uh, this talk is actually put together as part of a distinguished lecture series for the Groundwater Resources Association of California. Uh, so that's the lecture I'm giving you today. Uh, it's to promote education, and this fits into that quite nicely. If you've ever seen anything about land subsidence, no doubt you've seen this picture of Joe Colin, uh, who's using a telephone pole in the San Joaquin Valley to illustrate the amount of subsidence, which is about 30 feet, between 1925, uh, where the sign is up here, that's where the land surface was, and 1977, where he's standing. So we're looking at about 30 feet in 50 or so years um, looking at this, this photograph. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot of legs. I mean, everybody still shows this photograph. So people have been on me for um, a couple of years now to redo this. Uh, so I have, and uh, so this is what the new sort of picture looks like, and I'll explain a little bit more about this picture here in a little bit. Um, National Geographic just went out with us three weeks ago um, because this photo apparently was not professional enough for National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we went out with them a few weeks ago, and they'll, they'll publish one um, in November. And um, interestingly enough, National Geographic is not permitted to use Photoshop or any alteration of their photos. So, a little tidbit for you. All right, so this is a basic definition of land subsidence. It's a gradual settling or a sudden sinking of the Earth's surface owing to subsurface movement of material. Um, we say gradual or sudden because the kind that we're talking about today is going to be uh, more or less gradual, although it's pretty, pretty fast by gradual standards. Um, but you've also probably heard of like sinkholes opening up in Florida. That's also land subsidence, but that's really quick, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and the reason is because the, the type that I am talking about, the, the kind that's related to the exploitation of groundwater, is particularly important in California and is actually really important um, in our nation. Almost 80% of the identified uh, square area, the identified area in the U.S. is an exploitation. Okay, I'm not using it anymore. Um, is an exploitation of groundwater very important in our nation? Most of that subsidence is caused by the compaction of susceptible alluvial aquifer systems, and I'll get into a little bit about what susceptible means. Um, so what we're talking about is groundwater extraction and land subsidence occurring because of that. This is kind of put this in perspective. Um, I want to start with a global uh, perspective on subsidence. We're not the only game in town. Um, while our subsidence rates are fairly quick, uh, when we look at worldwide subsidence rates, um, we can see that there's, there's a lot of subsidence areas in, in uh, the United States. A lot in the West, right? Well, the West is where we use a lot of groundwater because we don't have a lot of surface water available. Uh, fortunate, sort of, for us in California, most of the kind of subsidence I'm talking about today is not on the coastline. Um, Jakarta, for instance, has a lot of subsidence, rapid subsidence, right on the coast. They don't have any topography to begin with. Um, the major city is now flooding with high tides. Um, so uh, at least the, the kind of subsidence that I'm talking about today and mostly uh, talking about the Central Valley is not on the coast. When you have subsidence on the coast, we're now having sea level rise. It absolutely exacerbates the subsidence problem. Venice had this too back in the day, um, where there was flood during high tide. Um, and you can see, you know, again, that, that you know California and uh, the U.S. has a lot of sort of marks of subsidence. So does China. This isn't an exhaustive list of where subsidence is happening in the world. You might correlate the number of triangles with the amount of development and resources, right? We know we have subsidence because we have the resources to go out and measure it. Uh, 
as does China. So there's probably a lot of unidentified areas uh, that are experiencing subsidence that are not on this map. Um, between us and China, uh, we have maximum areas affected and maximum magnitudes. Um, I think Mexico City is the only one that's beating out the um, Central Valley right now in California. Just to scope down a little bit more to look at sites in the United States, again, you can see all those dots in the west. Again, we use a lot more groundwater in the west than we do on the east coast. Uh, maximum areas affected here, California and Arizona. Maximum magnitudes uh, were in the lead, unfortunately. Uh, you can see some subsidence down here in the Gulf. These are coastal areas, and it is particularly bad for them. They also have to deal with, you know, storm surges, high tides, and sea level rise. Over here in the Chesapeake Bay, very small rates of subsidence, but the Chesapeake Bay is one of the areas in the world with the highest rates of sea level rise. So even small amounts of subsidence for this coastal plain community is a big problem for them. So scoping down a little bit more to just California, you can see uh, all the dots on the, on the uh, map. And then this table on the right, you might see a lot of W. Almost all of the subsidence in California is due to water withdrawal. But we also do pump oil and gas, which is just another fluid. And if we pump oil and gas, it has essentially the same effect as pumping uh, groundwater. Here's a, a, a photo of a protruding well. I know it's small, but uh, you might imagine that we don't pour concrete in air. Um, this is a bucket here for scale, by the way. Uh, so, so this is one of the consequences of land subsidence. As the land has fallen around this well, the well casing is holding up the concrete. Um, and there's uh, lots of reports of damaged wells in the Central Valley uh, lately. I want to just uh, show this. Uh, this is the Department of Water Resources basin prioritization. And essentially, the warm colors are high and medium priority basins. And you might notice that there's some uh, coincidence with areas of subsidence with these dots. And again, looking at this map with the warm colors being high and medium priority. Now, they didn't really use subsidence as part of their prioritization. It, it was kind of an ancillary piece of information that was used, but most of the information that they used to prioritize these basins were effect on people and things. Uh, but it happens to be pretty coincident with where we're, coincident with where we're seeing subsidence, too. <coughs> Now, a lot of times during this talk, I, I get a question at the end that asks, well, what about Delta subsidence? Um, and especially with this crowd, I figure I would uh, preemptively uh, attack that question by explaining the difference between what's happening in the Delta and what I'm going to spend the majority of the talk on today. So in the Delta, we do have a lot of subsidence. It's well known. It has been for a while. This type of subsidence is a very superficial process. And the reason is because it's not from groundwater pumping. Um, this is from the oxidation of peat that happens in the delta. So peat is deposited. Peat is essentially um, old plants that have decayed and uh, have formed a layer. It's very rich for farming. It's highly organic because it's all plant material. So when we uh, expose that land to the air, because most of the time, you know, it's kind of, you know, the delta is kind of swampy. It's in the tidal area, and it's submerged most of the time. Well, we, we drained a lot of those islands to farm on them. And what that did was expose these layers, these peat layers, to the atmosphere, and it vaporizes them. So this is like somebody going and taking a shovel and removing the top layers of sediment. So it's a very superficial process. The process that I'm going to talk about today is a very deep process. It's aquifer system compaction, and it's concentrated in fine grain units, so silt and especially clay. And clays are special because 
Um, they are shaped kind of like uh, dinner plates, for instance. So when you, when, when these clays are originally deposited, they're deposited in random orientations as shown here on the left. And uh, this might be similar to after you're done with, with dinner, you toss your dishes into the sink, and they're randomly oriented. Well, in this image, you can see that there's a lot of space between those grains. That's for water in storage. Clay holds more water than any other kind of sediment. And that's not as good as to a lot of people uh, because clay doesn't transmit water very well. Well, there's two different things. Clay does store water, store more than any other sediment, but it transmits it terribly. Well, when you start lowering groundwater levels, you're increasing stress on the, the geology, uh, the geologic layers. And what happens if you go beyond a certain threshold, called the pre-consolidation stress, but that's not particularly important, it's a threshold that's often marked by the previous lowest <laughs> groundwater level. What happens when you surpass that threshold is that these clay units that are oriented in random orientation actually rearrange themselves with more like a stack of plates that you put in your cupboard. And you can see in this image here that there's a lot less space between those grains. And the result is that clay can now store less water than it used to be able to. And if you reinflate the system by putting more groundwater back in, while it may push these grains apart a little bit, they're never going to go back in a random orientation, meaning that we have permanently lost the capacity of this aquifer system. And it also takes up less volume, right? So this takes up less space, thinner, and that's expressed at the land surface as land subsidence up here. <laughs> All right, so why do we care about land subsidence? Well, land subsidence damages both infrastructure and natural resources. Most people care about subsidence because it damages infrastructure and it's expensive. Water conveyance systems are particularly sensitive to subsidence. If you've ever driven out in the San Joaquin Valley, you know it's flat. These canals are built on very small gradients so that they can rely on gravity to move the water. It's free and it's relentless. So, for a canal to work right, if you're going to use gravity, then every point upstream on the canal has to be at a higher elevation than every point downstream. When you start lowering just part of a canal and putting a little hole in it, now every point upstream is not higher than every point downstream. This has the effect of reducing the conveyance capacity of that canal. Okay. It also reduces freeboard. Freeboard is the space between water surface and anything that crosses it. So when you're standing on a bridge and you look over the bridge, you should see water flowing under the bridge, right? That's sort of the normal, uh, the normal way things are. But when you have subsidence, then that space is reduced. And there's some places in the valley now where, where water is being bottlenecked because it's running into the bridge. Um, and these things have to be replaced. Now, everything is lowering, right? So why is water running into the bridge and everything is lowering? Well, to keep water flowing, we have to build up levees. We have to keep that water surface elevation high to keep it flowing downhill. If it's, an, if it's a lined canal, we get buckles in canal. Here's, here's, a, here's a picture here. Of course, you have breaks in the canal lining. You're going to have water seeping in behind that and start to uh, impair the integrity of the levee. If it's an unlined channel, such as the east side bypass um, that is in the San Joaquin Valley, a very important flood, then you start to get erosion and depositional patterns uh, that were not designed for that system. Okay, so, so water is very sensitive to subsidence, but anything that crosses these areas is differential subsidence. Roads, railways, bridges, pipelines, wells, 
Anything that crosses these areas are going to be impacted by subsidence. Water conveyance is happening to be the most sensitive because they're built at such specific elevations. Uh, this is a, a well that's in a, um, a vineyard. It's a gas well, a couple thousand feet deep, I think. When it was drilled in 2010, they painted the top of it orange so that farm equipment wouldn't hit it in the field. And within two years, two feet of this well were protruding. Um, so it's subsiding in that area at about a foot a year. This, uh, this is a picture of concrete offset. This is actually in the Coachella Valley, um, where uh, there's a lot of lawsuits and things going on because they can't open their doors and windows um, because everything's getting kind of out of square. So the so the other the other part of this is that it damages natural resources, and and probably you know one of the most important of those damages is that reduced aquifer system storage capacity because that's not fixable. You know, infrastructure, while expensive, is fixable. Uh, the reduction of the, the storage capacity of an aquifer system is not fixable. Uh, so that's a permanent problem. But as you can imagine, anything that's low, anything that hangs out in the lowest parts of the landscape, like wetlands, like rivers, uh, those are also going to be impacted by subsidence. So people ask what the economic impact is, and this is actually a really hard number to get at. Uh, so many times that damage in the field is not linked back to subsidence, so we never kind of close that loop and, uh, and keep track of damages that are related to subsidence. The Santa Clara Valley, they're one of the very few uh, success stories uh, in sort of subsidence research, and they're in California, we can claim, claim them. They actually arrested subsidence. Uh, they had big problems with subsidence and arrested it in the 90s. And so they kept a pretty good track of subsidence-related damages. And you can see here that you know the details aren't that important, but the levees were the most important. Those are the most expensive. Uh, but then you can see sewers here, bridges, well repairs, pumps, and uh, and channel levees also important. So we're trying to get a better handle on uh, the cost of the site in the San Joaquin Valley, um, but it's, it's difficult to get at. But we're starting to talk with railways, um, uh, Department of Water Resources is starting to keep better track as of Bureau of Reclamation. So how do we measure subsidence? Well, historically we use benchmarks in networks, like this upper image here, upper left. And we use spirit leveling, which, by the way, is still the most accurate way to measure an elevation and an elevation change. But it's expensive, and you don't get that many data points, right? These are done on still quite a bit, long railways sometimes. More recently, uh, in the last 20 years, we've used GPS. And, uh, and that's brought the cost down a little bit. It's not as accurate as spirit leveling, and the vertical GPS isn't that great. Uh, about plus or minus two centimeters, if you're lucky. We've also used these instruments called extensometers. And they're kind of cool, they're kind of special because they're the only measurement we have that actually has some depth interval component to it. So GPS, spirit leveling, and I'll talk about INSAR in a minute, these are all techniques that measure all of the lenses, change, between the land surface and theoretically the center of the Earth, where extensometers have some anchor depth. So let's say I have an extensometer that's 330 feet deep, 500 feet, and 1,000 feet deep. And I can compare the measurements of compaction in those different intervals and be able to say, oh, most of what's happening in the or most of what's happening between 500 and 1,000 feet deep. These instruments are the only way to do that, and, and I think with the legislation that was recently passed, that these instruments are going to become uh, even more important in California because, um, you know, when, when this regulation is actually put into place and, uh, and some farmer says, you know, to his neighbor, hey, you know, it's your fault, you're pumping too much and causing a sudden, and he points to an oil derrick and says, how do you know it's me? 
So, um, so anyway, these are, are very important for targeted mitigation. You know where the science is happening. You have a better shot of uh, designing mitigation to uh, help that subsidence reduce the rate or stop it completely. It's also very helpful for groundwater flow and subsidence models to know where the action is happening. The, the other way we measure subsidence is, is like the greatest thing to fly spread. It's called INSAR. Euro did a very good job of pronouncing it, interferometric synthetic aperture radar. And this is a satellite or airborne technique. We use primarily satellite based. And it's just radar. So a satellite orbiting the Earth collects radar data. If it does it more than once, we can combine those data sets together and they're sensitive in the vertical range. And this gives us a great spatial density of subsidence data, unlike any of these other methods. So all these other methods we're talking about, tens or dozens of points at the best. With one instar it covers 100 square kilometers, and I can get millions of data points. Like having a GPS surveyor every 90 meters or so in some places. So all of these different measurement techniques bring something to the table. Spirit leveling, that's really where our historical data is. So that's really important for historical data, knowing where elevations were, so that we can make those silly photographs with poles and show that elevation change. GPS is great. There's some continuous GPS stations out there, um, and this is a picture of one of them. These are actually run by a completely different group. They're looking at uh, plate boundary motions between the North American and Pacific plate along the San Andreas fault system. Uh, but they have some located in the Central Valley that we use to monitor subsidence. Extensometers bring that depth interval uh, that we don't get from any other measurement. And then INSAR really gives us this great spatial picture of what's going on. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of sort of the subsidence that's going on now or have recently uh, been occurring, uh, we're working in a variety of areas. This isn't just us, by the way. Uh, Santa Clara Valley runs our own subsidence monitoring uh, network. And, um, but today I'm just going to talk about the Central Valley. So just to put the Central Valley in perspective, it's big, 20,000 square miles, but it's not that big compared to the rest. It's only about 1% of the farmland. Yet it provides about 70% of the U.S. agricultural output and more than half as many of our fruits, nuts, and vegetables in the United States. Uh, approximately a fifth, or 20% of the groundwater in the nation is pumped just from the Central Valley. Uh, so 1% uh, so of the land, 20% of the groundwater, and um, at least a quarter of the nation's food, uh, some, some crops are much higher than that. So here's kind of a punchline, and I'm going to show you how we got here. So about 7,200 square kilometers in the San Joaquin Valley were affected by at least one inch or so of subsidence over a two-year period. Uh, we, we like to pick the 2008 to 2010 time frame because we actually have data during that period that covers the entire San Joaquin Valley. Otherwise, you know, we have data for, you know, 2005, 2011, in some places, uh, but 2008 to 2010, we have it for the whole valley. And the limited data that's been collected from then indicate that these rates have continued and in some cases accelerated um, through 2014, and that was particularly evident last summer. This is absolutely affecting water conveyances and other infrastructure, including Federal Canal, the Hood Canal, the Bryant Kern Canal. It's uh, affecting California, <coughs> California's um, Africa. Also, the San Joaquin River, the East Side Bypass, which I already mentioned, was a, it's a very important flood control channel. We haven't had to use it in a while. Uh, we're a little concerned about uh, when we do have to use it, how it's going to perform. And um, it's supposed to help 
the San Joaquin Valley not flood as bad when we have big flooding events down there? So subsidence occurred when groundwater levels declined as a result of pumping. They continue to decline, and they are many are near, and, and a lot of them are lower than historical lows. And remember, that's when that that clay rearranges itself and goes into a flat situation where we have reduced storage capacity and land subsidence. Now we looked away from land subsidence for a long time uh, in California. Uh, we we thought the problem was fixed when we put the California aqueduct in, and I'll go over that briefly here in a minute. Um, we can never look away that long again. Um, we were very much surprised that we found subsidence at rates that we did and in the places that we did. So a little subsidence history. When when Joe Poland put that photo together, um, he was about right here or so when he took that photo. And you see it's on the west side of the valley where most of the subsidence occurred. I know that these contours are kind of light, I apologize. But the point is, is that most of the subsidence is on the west side. You can see groundwater levels here declining, and you can see compaction occurring in the 60s. Well, in 1970, groundwater levels started to recover, and that's because water was starting to get loaded down the California aqueduct. And you can see subsidence, really slowed and essentially stopped, except during droughts, right? So here we have the 76, 77 drought. We saw groundwater levels plummet very quickly, by the way. This very fast decline and recovery of groundwater levels is a manifestation of loss of storage capacity of the aquifer system. You can see compaction reinitiated, when that drought was over, water level recovery began again until the next drought. So when we started this study, we thought we would find drought in the same places that we used to find it. And while that's true, we also found it in some new places. This is where that uh, graph comes from, by the way, this area. And the new areas that we're seeing are up here. And this does have quite a bit of historical subsidence down here, but it's much, much bigger now than it used to be. The next graph I'm going to show is where the star is located. So when we started this study in 2009, it was because of the previous drought, drought that started in 2007. Again, there was reduced surface water importation, just like the previous drought. So we thought that, you know, people would rely on groundwater for more, and we would find subsidence in the same places that we used to. However, as it turns out, we're seeing the same subsidence rate in some places during droughts and between droughts. It has absolutely nothing to do with how much water is coming down any river or any canal. So on this graph, the brown is subsidence, and the blue is groundwater level. And the purple line just marks the previous lowest level, which, what do you know, is at the end of the last drought. At this site, you can see that there's just subsidence during drought, pretty much uh, flattened out between droughts, and corresponds very nicely to groundwater levels. Groundwater levels decline, you see subsidence. Groundwater levels recover, you don't see subsidence. So this is a, 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 an amalgamation of several interferer grounds into our measurements, essentially. And the warm colors show you where subsidence is. So historically, remember, the subsidence is here on the west side. That's not where we're seeing the, the action here. Again, we're seeing it in these two areas. Now, when we started this study, our job was to look at the Delta Mendota Canal. And so we picked these satellite scenes to cover the Delta Mendota Canal, which is here. And we could see that we were kind of missing something. And uh, we'll get back to that area in just a minute. But I want to show you what we found along the Delta Mendota Canal, because I learned something last year that I, I really didn't understand before then. And this study's been out for a couple of years now. Uh, so this graph shows the Delta Mendota Canal shows its check stations. Check stations are just structures along a canal that control the water surface elevation and the flow in the canal. And this is, uh, and they wanted to know what was happening at each of their check stations. So, uh, so we looked at 
the data for each of their check stations and found that, well, the top, you know, the top part of this is fairly stable. Uh, it's when you get down here, you know, between check 16 and 17, and then uh, the, the end of the line down here that you get quite a bit more subsidence. I know these numbers are small, uh, but this here is about 10 to 15 millimeters, goes all the way down to 40, so you're looking at 40 around here. Now, for canal operators, this is where they're going to find their problems between check 16 and 17, 17 and 18, and 20 and 21, because that's where the differential subsidence is the most. Checks 18 through 20 right here, they're subsiding at about the same rate, meaning at least the gradient of the canal is more or less maintained in that stretch. Well, I got a call from these guys from the Delta Mendoza Water Authority last year. They were given five days to refill San Luis Reservoir, which is right here. They were given five days to refill it as much as possible. It was very low. So not a specific volume, but a number of days. And they called and said, your data shows exactly where we're having the problem with check seven. I was like, check seven? <laughs> I didn't even write about that in my report. It was about all that kind of lower stuff for the massive subsidence flow. But they were having a ball in check seven because of the subsidence upstream. So water was being pumped in here and coming down. Well, there's an increased gradient, and then you can see it had to go uphill a bit to get at check seven. So they're having a ball in this. So even 10 to 15 millimeters of subsidence over a couple of years impacted their ability to refill San Luis as much as they could have otherwise. So it doesn't matter where you have it necessarily. I mean, or how much you have, it matters where you have subsidence. So that was that was news to me. I didn't understand that. And this is uh, just a profile along the canal. So blue is the elevation of the canal as it's built, and red is how it looked in 2010. And you can see there's a pinch point here, a pinch point here, and a pinch point down here. So just another way to look at it. All right, so now let's get between those uh, between those scenes that I had looked at for the Delta Nagoda study. We found and found, wow, you know, we're looking at almost a foot a year in this area. It's right in between the San Joaquin River and the East Side Bypass. And the Department of Water Resources alerted us to this and, and Bureau of Reclamation because they're working on the San Joaquin River Restoration Project, saying, hey, we're doing these surveys and they're not. Something's not right. Keep doing them, and you know, it looks like there's a lot of subsidence going on, on here. And so that's when we processed this interferogram and confirmed uh, their high rates of measurement, but also that the area was huge. It doesn't it doesn't all show here. I'll show you in a minute. But it goes just about from I-5 to 99, and from Merced on the north up here to Mendota on the south. So a huge area being impacted by subsidence. Well, the next uh, the next graph I'm going to show you is a close up of this box. So I just contoured the interferogram and uh, put the east side bypass in it. So water has to flow from A prime to A because all water in the San Joaquin Valley essentially has to get out the Golden Gate. No outlet in the San Joaquin Valley. That's why it's such bad flooding hazard when it does flood. And I looked at the instar data along that canal. So here's how water has to flow. Now it has to fill up this hole before it goes down into this hole before it eventually flows out. Now granted, this is you know greatly vertically exaggerated, but it gives you an idea of how that east side bypass may have a problem uh, when it's called into action in case of flood. GPS measurements, naturally we have none uh, where we'd like them. So we do have them on the edges, and these show interesting, uh, interesting data. They're all a little bit different. So P304 is the one I showed you before, just subsidence during drought periods here, pretty much flattens out between droughts. Uh, this is out by Mendota. Uh, P307, this is by um, um, Madeira, Madeira, and it shows subsidence rates that pretty much are uninterrupted by a drought. It's pretty much the same during droughts and during non-drought periods. And same thing with P303, this is by Los Banos. What this tells me is that farms by P303 and by P307 
don't have much access to surface water. Whereas down here they do. When it's available, they're apparently not pumping as much as sizes of the rest of between drought. So then I did a few of these um, new polling photos at a few locations around the area that where the most subsidence has been measured. Um, naturally, none of these are in the middle of the subsidence bowl either. That's how it always goes. Um, but they all show something different. So this is between 1965 and 2003 and shows about seven feet of subsidence, a little bit more. We only have two measurements in this location. But at the second location, we have a few more. This is the one that was in the introductory slide. And this really does show us something. So in 16 years, between 1988, which was not far from when I graduated high school, so my head was about where the land surface was when I graduated high school. And uh, between then and 2004, it's about 16 years, about 2.3 feet of subsidence occurred. During the next four years, almost a half a foot, and during the next five, triple that. So we're seeing a rapid increase in subsidence in this area. There's a third location. I know I look really angry in the picture, but I'm not. It was really bright. <laughs> and I'm trying not to let my eyes water. So anyway, we only have two measures. This is right on Highway 152. And, um, and I'm showing about uh, one and a half feet of subsidence during just a five-year period. So this is on a major highway route. And uh, this one, also interesting, this may indicate a more or less steady rate of subsidence, right? 16 years between 1965 and 81, we have two and a half feet, and about double the amount of time, we have about double the amount of subsidence. Um, we don't know if this is actually true. This 1981 elevation isn't that great. Um, and it's the, re it's, it's the way that they did the survey. They started this, so this is probably underestimated. I think this is the last one. This is at Sac Dam. So this is where uh, DWR, Bureau of Reclamation, were doing a lot of work for the San Joaquin River Restoration Project. Subsidence so is a big problem for them because they have planned to build a five foot high dam in an area that's subsiding at about a foot a year. You know how long it builds, takes to build a dam? Well, by ribbon cutting, it might be underwater, right? So that's a problem. Um, they had to scrap those plans. And, and this, this shows a really huge increase in subsidence between 1981 and 2008, just over a foot of subsidence, and then the next five years, about 2.2 feet. All right, so, so overall, so this is where we had historical subsidence, and this is where we're seeing it now. Now, the reason that we're seeing subsidence, part of the reason that we're seeing subsidence, in this area up here, during droughts and between droughts, same rate is because they have very little access to surface water. There's also a shift in land use, and you've probably seen this all over the news recently, that there is a shift to planting permanent crops at the expense of row crops and rangeland. Now, this has a couple of effects. First of all, it's a long-term investment. And you can't fallow a permanent crop. It takes something like seven or eight years to get your first pistachio. So it's a investment, and young trees, as they get more mature, require more water. So this is a problem I don't think is going to go away anytime real soon. Certainly, you know, we didn't have any idea when we started this study that we would find some sites between droughts. Uh, and to not only find it, but to find it at the very same rates that we're seeing during droughts uh, is a bit alarming. So again, historical and more recent. You can see it's a huge area affected. The white line, by the way, is uh, the area affected by at least one inch over a two-year period. All right, so we know that most of the compaction occurred below the Corcoran clay. 
The San Joaquin Valley is this assemblage of sand and gravel and a lot of clay, by the way. One and a half of the valley is composed of clay, which is our big player in subsidence. And there's a, an unconfined or semi-confined system. And then there's a the Corcoran clay, which is an extensive thick clay unit, which you may think, oh, that's a problem. A problem. It's actually not. Um, we, we will shake our fist at it in about 5,000 years because it is draining very slowly, but it's not the elephant in the valley right now. Um, it's these, these little clay lenses uh, that are compacting and primarily beneath the Corcoran clay. More water is pumped from beneath the Corcoran clay because the water quality is better. So we know it's occurred mostly beneath the Corcoran clay because we have one of those cool extensometers talked about. It's very shallow. It's anchored in the top of the Corcoran clay. And right nearby, we have this continuous GPS station that you've already seen a few times, data from it. And you can see that most of the compaction is happening below the Nothing, nothing is happening above the Corcoran clay, but most is happening below. That's near Mendota. And then another line of evidence we have is water levels in Los Banos in the shallow well, pretty flat. And then you see subsidence here in red. So apparently water level in the shallow system is not the stress that's causing the compaction. Naturally, we don't have any water, water levels in deep wells in that area. But you gotta have both things, right? So you have to have groundwater level decline, and you have to have the right geologic setting. Okay, and that means clay. Gotta have clay. But we have both of these things. So looking at a shallow well on top and a deep well on bottom, these are both near Mendota, and you can see that groundwater levels decline during these last droughts. The shallow one is almost at historically low levels. So will the, the shallow aquifer system become more important in compaction? Probably, yes, probably will. And then in the deep system, you can see here levels um, for quite some time, at least the last year and a half. So we have groundwater level declines, and we have the right geologic setting. So this is kind of a weird image to look at, but it's essentially wells hung in space. And up at the northern end, here's Redding up here, and Bakersfield's down here. There's kind of the delta area. And the blue colors indicate clay, right? So you can see we have a lot of clay. Sacramento, is, Sacramento Valley is no exception to this. The very southern end of the valley, a bit more coarse grain. Looking at a texture model that we built from these 8,500 well logs that we digitized, you can see that the blue colors are clay, and you can see more blue here and more blue here, and this is where we're seeing subsidence. Interestingly enough, these are shallow sediments, and the reason that these areas have more clay than surrounding areas is because the fans that were coming off of the Sierra Nevada mountains were not connected to glaciation in this area. Glaciers like to send out big pulses of coarse grain sediment. Well, these, these fans are not connected to those pulses of coarse grain sediment. So there's a lot of fine grain sediment, even in the very shallow subsurface. And this is where we're seeing subsidence now. So it really does beg the question. While historically we saw more subsidence in the deeper system, how much is coming from the shallow system now? And we, we don't really have an answer for that. It's going to be important to have an answer for it, though, because, you know, farmers don't want the subsidence to happen either. It causes a lot of problems for them. They have to drill deeper. The wells are collapsing. They laser level the, their fields. And they're starting to try to, try to help subsidence by saying, hey, Hey, neighbor, since you're growing pistachios, and that can take slightly less, you know, water quality than, than your almonds, can you, you know, I'll, I'll be willing to let you use water from my shallow well to water your pistachios, and that way you can turn off your deep well. So they're, they're trying to do some things to help with subsidence, except we don't have any instrumentation in place to know how that's working. Um, so, so it's going to be important to know how much of the shallow system is going to has contributed or is going to start contributing more to subsidence. 
So I'm just down to my last few slides here, and I just wanted to show you what's happening now, what's been happening in the last couple of years. And I'm using my extensometers for this. Um, you know, there's like 30 of these things built in the San Joaquin Valley in the 50s and the 60s. Um, but mostly they were abandoned, right? When the California aqueduct came in, groundwater levels started to recover, subsidence was essentially fixed. As with any other problem, right? You don't keep sending resources to that problem if it's fixed, they go somewhere else. Um, so we abandoned this network for a long time. And we looked away for decades. Uh, we're looking back now, and we've refurbished a few of these exosometers, and I'm going to show you just data from a few of them. So we're going to start up here, it's called Oroloma, this is on the Delta Medota Canal. The next one is Pinochi down here, GWR Yard, and Rasta. So the first one is on the Delta Medota Canal, the next three are on the California Aqueduct. Everybody asks me why is it called Rasta? because we had the machine shop we were using at Sac State, had a lot of extra paint around that happened to be red, yellow, and green. And so that's the color of our components that we painted in that site. So that is why. All right, so the most site here. So on the upper graph, I have the entire period of record. Brown is always compaction. Blue is always groundwater levels. And the lower graph, I'm just showing the last few years. So again, you know, here you can see historically things really started to flatten out in the 70s because California aqueduct was delivering water. All right, we looked away for a long time, especially groundwater levels. You know, what, 30 years of no data? And uh, when we came back, this is what we found. Here's subsidence in the last few years. And you can see ground are at historically low levels. This water level means nothing, the casing is broken, so I uh, don't pay too much attention to that. But you can see here, this last summer, lots of subsidence, much more than I saw the previous couple of summers. Um, and I was just out there last week or the week before, and it looks like we're in for more of the same this summer, not a surprise. So we saw about three inches of compaction at this site last summer. Moving down a little bit, this is the Pinochet site. This is near the California Aqueduct. Um, here you can see ground uh, slowing down. And here we are at the end here. We see subsidence reinitiating. Groundwater levels are really falling quite a lot at this site. Uh, interestingly enough, they just planted an almond orchard near the site. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what uh, the difference is in the data from this site from row crops, which is the last few years of data that I have, and moving forward with an almond orchard. Uh, again, you can see groundwater levels uh, have a seasonal component. They came back up pretty high this winter, so be curious to see uh, the future data at this site. This next site is down on the California Aqueduct, and here you can see we're at very near historical low levels. Um, if you happen to see the 60 minutes, uh, episode that was played, a, I guess, a couple months ago now. This is the building where Leslie Stahl was sitting with my boss, Claudia, um, measuring water levels and talking about uh, groundwater in the Central Valley. Uh, here you can see subsidence, pretty rapid, um, and it puts it in perspective with rates during the 90s. Last site, Rasta, again, groundwater levels lately. Very near historical low levels down here, and you can see compaction reinitiating. So what's the future trend? Well, it's hard to know for sure. Um, but we do see increased subsidence occurring on the east side of the valley, and that's really because of climate change. As water is coming down at different timing, right, because more is going to start falling, is already falling as rain rather than snow, they're not going to be able to capture as much uh, unless we do some, uh, some changes in our practices like using aquifer systems as storage reservoirs, which Kern County does quite well. Um, so we see a lot of changes on the east side of the valley because of climate change and increased need for pumping because of this change in surface water uh, that's happening. And what do we do about it? Well, scientifically, that's a really easy question to answer. It's much harder to do in practice. 
What do you have to do? You have to keep groundwater levels above that critical by reducing withdrawal or increasing recharge. So for decreasing withdrawal, you can either, you know, decrease the demand, redistribute the, the groundwater use, increase supplemental water supply like surface water, or enhance groundwater recharge. That can be either artificial or just protecting our natural recharge areas, right? Don't, don't put a parking lot on top of a recharge area. Now, like I said, much harder to do in practice. So this is just the same subsidence, uh, summary slide that I showed you before. There's a website on the bottom if you would like some more information. I appreciate your attention and thank you very much. And we do have a pleasant um I'm sorry. Um to do I mean yeah, um to a lot to do is a talk a little bit about um do you have uh, any illustrations or any evidence? Are you tracking what is happening? Well, it's, it's difficult to do that. Um, Bureau of Reclamation is tracking quite closely what's happening in the San Joaquin uh, restoration area. They're per uh, but they're tracking it quite quite closely. What are you What are you learning, or what are you seeing? In the well, like I mentioned, I mean, one of the biggest things was was them having to scrap a, a dam and fish passage project and figuring out how to deal with this subsiding area um, and, and, you know, I, I'm not sure what they're going to do. I, I think the last I heard they were going to kind of get around this hole. Um, so, you know, there's, there's bridges that are, have to come out and be replaced because, you know, water's now running into the bridge, it's seeping in and starting to harm the integrity of the bridge, so those have to be ripped out. Um, California, you know, the California aqueduct and, and federal canals, so state and federal canals, you know, they have the resources to, to keep, you know, building up the levees and building up their tech structures and doing what they have to do to keep the capacity maintained in those canals. But there are numerous local canals out there um, that are having to sort of, you know, take the damages as they come from subsidence. I know there's some canals out there that can only transmit about 50% of the water that they're originally designed to. One of your images, you see any of the um, that's a good question. I don't know uh, about any big biologic efforts to track how native vegetation is doing. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, by connecting those data with, uh, with some resource economics to find out when it becomes no longer profitable to farm in those areas that are not, that are locally managed, where the is so bad that they can't uh, move water through anymore? That's, that's a good question. I mean, there's already, you know, a problem going on with sort of the, the haves and the have-nots. So larger farms can afford to drill deeper wells and keep their crops, you know, do what they have to do to keep their crops watered. It's some of those smaller farmers that are having a hard time. And, you know, it's not like the, the San Joaquin Valley is about to run out of water, but it's getting deeper. And at the bottom, there's brine. At what point do you start entraining bad water quality to the deep that we've never, you know, had to deal with before? So it's really is going to become more of, you know, people say, well, when are we going to run out of water? And it's really more of an economic issue of, you know, at what point can you afford to and what point can't? And we're already seeing that happen. I mean, there's, there's you know, there's been a trend for a long time, really, of, of less smaller farms and and you were you know bigger on. Oh, um, you mentioned that 
The maps that I showed you in the valley, that's all subsidence. So whether, you know, some of that is caused from oil and gas, we don't know. It's a bulk measurement. Uh, most of the, what we're seeing for subsidence is, you know, Kettleman Hills and those kinds of areas that we're seeing pretty massive rates of subsidence. Um, but we're not studying it specifically, no. Interesting. The delta has about three billion cubic meters of subsidence. Have you calculated the total volume of subsidence? I haven't. I haven't. That's hard to do. I could do it for that two year period, but otherwise, I have just bits of data for other time periods. So I could calculate that. Would you have anything in presentation? I'm curious. Um, as to whether or not data is being collected. Bureau of Reclamation and Department of Water Resources are doing periodic surveys in the valley. There is also this NSAR data that's being collected. Uh, we don't have the funding to process it at this time. Um, funding is a bigger issue than you might think um, during these uh, sort of critical times. But it is being collected. The data are freely available from the European Space Agency. Uh, these are not NASA satellites. These are all foreign space agency satellites that we rely on. And um, but the Europeans are, are providing that for free. You have to process it, of course. Um, and the Japanese are also collecting data that is, that is not free. I'm curious if there's any uh, facts with the uh, Oh, yeah, those are really small. Yeah, you're talking about from the, the study of the continuous GPS stations that show this overall uplift in the western states. Yeah, that's really small compared to what we're seeing. Yeah. 